So the question is how to live a long life of health, beauty, power, riches, high birth, and wisdom. This is a part of an introduction from a, uh, a section on dana and in Buddhism in general. And it says, you want long life, health, beauty, power, riches, high birth, and wisdom, or even some of these things? They do not appear by chance. It is not someone's luck that they are healthy or another's lack of it that he is stupid. Though it may not be clear to us now, all such inequalities among human beings and all sorts of beings come about because of the comma they have made individually. Each person reaps his own fruits. So if one is touched by short life, sickliness, ugliness, insignificance, poverty, low birth, or stupidity, and one does not like these things, no need to just accept that that is the way it is. The future need not be like that, provided that one makes the right kind of comma now. Knowing what comma to make and what not to make is the mark of a wise man. It is also the mark of one who no longer drifts aimlessly, but has some direction in life and control over the events that will occur. So you look at your life and you can bounce from one central pleasure to another. And maybe you throw in some sittings, you throw in some listening to some podcast, and then you go to the movies and then you, then you, you know, get married and then you go, you know, you just kind of bounce all of these places. So what does everybody really want? They want a happy and prosperous, healthy, wise life. So let's do the things that get us there. Let's not think, oh yeah, but I, I'm not greedy. I, I don't want any of those things. You know, I'm, I'll just accept what I have. No, don't do that. You're here. You're trying to improve yourself. So let's get this whole program going. That's what the Buddha taught. You know, not just Nibbana. He taught about, he taught the whole, the whole circle, the whole cycle. And the way that that works is that there's morality and there is dana, and there's bhavana. So it's morality, uh, generosity, and meditation. So the first thing is morality. Morality is following the precepts. So from now to your next retreat, follow the precepts. Don't break them. Not even for anything. Leave the ants alone. Let the spiders spin. Just Get a critter catcher from Amazon.com and catch them and take them to your neighbor's house. <laughs> <laughs> or somewhere else. Um, and you can do that. Now, I, I know that, you know, ants and things are a problem with some people. And you can also, number one, just live with them the way they are um, or sweep them out every day. Or you can move. It's your choice. <laughs> okay. You can always follow the precepts. There is never a time that you can't follow them. Sometimes it'll be a little harder than others. So, um, Don't steal. Don't take things that are not given. That's pretty clear. Lying. Lying. No harsh speech. Um... But lies, white lies. Don't tell lies to get your, yourself out of a predicament. You know, you may have grabbed something off a table and you weren't thinking and somebody says, did you take that? There's a no, no, I, I didn't take it. And you go, well, that's just a white lie. It's just nothing. It doesn't matter. It was a cookie, you know. But don't do that. Tell them, oh, yeah, I wasn't thinking and I took that cookie. Is it okay? So get permission. You don't have to lie ever. You can always just tell the truth. Sometimes you don't have to tell the truth at all. You don't have to say anything. Um, somebody says, do I look beautiful today? And they've got the worst clothes on you've ever seen. Well, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really interesting. It's colorful. So... 
you told the truth. Of course, it might not have been the truth they want to hear, but it's the truth. And maybe you just can't say anything at all. And you just say, uh, uh, j hold on, I, you know, I think, you know, I, I got to go do something. And so out you go. Or like a politician, you ask a question. <laughs> you say, sir, are you going to give money to everybody so we can all be happy? And the politician says, we're going to get more energy for everybody. And that's for sure. Next question. You know, it's not, don't, don't answer the question. Just change the subject. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing to me. I hear some of them giving answers and I go, that's just, that is just lying. Just answer the question, please. But no, no, they're not going to, because that might get them in trouble. Um, okay. So that's, okay, morality. So lies, uh, sexual misconduct. Well, no adultery. Uh, no sex with people that are young. Okay, this is not things that will happen. Cheating can happen. Don't do that. That's, that will wreck your, your life. You can lose your, your, your reputation. Yeah, you, you, you know, that's just, just a, that's the big one that we have to look look out for is cheating and just say, well, it's just one night. Nobody will ever know. Well, they will know and they'll find out. It's it's inevitable because you know and the other person knows and just be careful of that. Um, no alcohol, no intoxicants. Doesn't mean you can't smoke cigarettes or, yeah, or drink coffee. That's not intoxicating, especially after you've drank a lot of coffee after a while, it's just nothing. And smoking, I think, is the same way, way, although I never smoke, so. But on the other hand, with alcohol, you know, you don't get over that. It, some people say, don't drink to the point of uh, heedlessness. And of course, what does that mean? And by the time you've, on your third shot, you're going, well, I'm, f I'm feeling good. And then, oh, wow, it hits you. Well, now you've, gone way over the limit. You don't know where that limit is. You know, these things take time to have their effect. The Buddha said, he said, the amount of liquor that I want monks to drink is the amount that will fit on the tip of a piece of kusa, kusa grass. And there's like a pointed grass. That's how much alcohol you're allowed, monks. Because one time an arhat who was an, on an alms round he went to a house and they gave him some nice food and they gave him some elephant liquor. He didn't know what it was and he drank it. And they, they got up and they, they left and they continued their alms round. And the Buddha looks back and this arhat has collapsed on the ground. And he says, oh. And <laughs> what, with his psychic power, he builds a little grass hut over the arhat. And he, he then tells the monks, you know, please, no alcohol. What had happened is that the arhat had drank this elephant liquor by mistake. He didn't know. And the lay person, who knows what they were thinking. And he collapsed. And so he came to, the hut came off, and the Buddha said, are you okay? And the arhat, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. And so there's the, that's the, the problem with alcohol. And there's one other case where uh, a monk gets drunk and then the Buddha lays down the rule uh, in the precepts. At first there were only four precepts and then the alcohol and the intoxicants came later. And he laid down that rule, there's no alcohol or intoxicants. So he added that. But you'll see in most of the suttas that it's, it's in there. It's, so it was pretty early on. So that's, that's the morality. So keep that carefully. I can, I can tell you that if you don't, um, those attainments will be very hard to come by. There have been a number of people who come and they just get on the edge and it just doesn't happen. And I say, and Bonte says, have you been following your precepts? Well, for the most part, 
Yeah, it's just uh, some alcohol I was drinking with friends. No big deal. He said, aha, don't do that anymore. Just that little bit. So if you want to make sure that you get your attainments next time, hey, precepts. Um, Donna. So giving, generosity, not only giving money, but giving things, giving help, giving lodging. Um, this was said by the Blessed One, said by the Arhat, so I have heard. Monks, if beings knew as I know the results of giving and sharing, they would not eat without having given, nor would the stain of selfishness overcome their minds. Even if it were their last bite, their last mouthful, they would not eat without having shared if there were someone to receive their gift. But because beings do not know, as I know, the results of giving and sharing, they eat without having given. The stain of selfishness overcomes their minds. If beings knew what the great seer said, how the result of sharing has such great fruit, then subduing the stain of selfishness with brightened awareness, they'd give in season to the noble ones where a gift bears great fruit. Having given food as an offering to those, worthy, to those worthy of offerings, many donors, when they pass away from here, the human state, go to heaven. They, having gone there to heaven, rejoice, enjoying sensual pleasures, unselfish, they parta partake of the result of sharing. So, give when you can. It just, you know, just... If you go out to lunch with somebody, buy their lunch. You know, pretty soon what happens is you think, well, I don't have enough money to buy all these lunches and dinners. And pretty soon you'll see that money will start to flow toward your wallet again. As your money goes out, it'll actually start to come back and you'll be able to give bigger things. So you start here, you give, 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 and pretty soon you're going to get very prosperous especially giving to monks. You know, the Buddha had his, the system really figured out because he said the monks cannot uh, keep food in their cooties. They can't make their own food. They can't cook. So they have to go into town to get alms. So when they would go into town in the line, the people would line up. They would give them food. Well, what's happening? These lay people are making huge amounts of merit. The monks are being fed and the lay people are getting the benefit of this huge amount of merit. So there's this back and forth between the monks are supported and the lay people are supported, maybe not at that moment, but in the future, they're going to get great fruit from that. So that was a... And the other part of that is the monk, typically, if he's invited to a house, he'll partake of the food and then he'll give a Dhamma talk to the people who gave it to him. So the lay supporters support the monks, the monks give the Dhamma back. So what we're trying to do here is with morality and generosity is we're trying to build our larger 401k. Everybody knows what a 401k is. It's your, it's your savings. It's your retirement plan. Well, this is your retirement plan for not just when you're 65, but for when you're, who knows in what lifetime you're at. You know, do you want to live in a celestial palace? Well, do what it takes to live there. Give to monks. Give, be generous. Um... Do you want to live in a uh, without anger, without sensual desire? Well, of course, then meditate. Um, do you want to have no accidents and not get sick? When you hurt somebody, that uh, the result of that is sickness. Like I may have hurt somebody, but now I'm sick. Who knows in the past? When you kill somebody, you have a shorter life. Uh, when you steal, you're poor. When you lie, you have no reputation. Nobody believes you. They don't, they don't trust you. 
Um, adultery, well, you, you know, marriage is probably a far, a long way away. Uh, intoxication, um, your mind is intoxicated. So, so do all the things that will create a prosperous life. And this will, when you follow the five, one of the benefits for following the five precepts is that you will re, be reborn in a heavenly realm. That's one of the benefits. One of the other benefits of following the precepts is also that you will not die from an accident in this lifetime. So if you get in a car accident, you won't die. You may be hurt, but you won't die. Um, let's see, what are the other? Yeah, so. So I'll think of things as we go here. So we're trying to create our positive life. So um, in addition to generosity, there is the giving out of loving kindness. What is the power of loving kindness? In Samyutta Nikaya, the pots of food, the Opama Samyutta, it says, at Savati, because if someone were to give away a hundred pots of food as charity in the morning, a hundred pots of food at noon, and a hundred pots of food as charity in the evening, and if someone to, were to develop a mind of loving kindness, even for the time it takes to pull a cow's udder, either the morning, at noon, or in the evening, this would be more fruitful than the former. Therefore, bhikkhus, you should train yourselves thus. We will develop and cultivate the liberation of mind by loving kindness and make it our vehicle, make it our basis, stabilize it, exercise ourselves in it, and fully perfect it. Thus should you train yourselves. So what have you been doing on this retreat for hours and hours? Developing loving kindness. More than just the time it takes to pull a cow's udder. And just that time it takes to pull a cow's udder, the merit of developing this loving kindness is more powerful than feeding a hundred or giving out a hundred pots of food morning, noon, and night. And there's a lot of power in giving out a hundred pots of food or just giving alms. Uh, but loving kindness is even more powerful. That's developing the mind. Okay. Now here's here's some f fun little stuff <clears throat> for your at home. The Buddha covered everything. Uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya 2.8, uh, the Book of Fives, uh, the dangers of not brushing your teeth. Bhikkhus, these five are the dangers for not partaking of the toothpick. What five? Now in India they have a, a tooth, they take a branch and they... they Skin it down with, I, you've probably seen them. Neem tree. Yeah, a neem tree. Neem. neem, neem, neem tree. Okay, that's like neem oil, right? That's why people even have neem toothpaste Yeah, thing. because it's, it's anti-bacterial. Uh, yeah, that's why you'll see people just break a branch and peel Break a branch and start, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and thus toothpicks are born. But what are the five dangers for not doing that? It becomes unpleasant to the sight. The mouth smells. The taste conductors do not get a cleansing. Bile and phlegm does not cover up the food. Food becomes disagreeable to him because these five are the dangers for not partaking of the toothpick. <laughs> uh, another Anguttara fives. Bhikkhus, these five are the benefits of drinking porridge. Now, porridge is a, it's just a rice gruel. What five? Hunger is appeased. Thirst is appeased. The winds behave accordingly. The gases. The bladder gets washed out. The digested gets pushed out. Because these five are the benefits of drinking porridge. So, monks drink rice gruel in the morning. Um, it's just... What's the name of the... Uh, the rice gruel that it's uh, it's a special, and then they put a little bit of broth in it. In any case, this is breakfast for some of the monks, and that's all they eat for breakfast. And then they'll have they'll go out for alms. 
Some won't have any meal at all. It just depends where you are. So this is about wailing. Singing is wailing. Well, let me read the sutta. This is from the Anguttara Nikaya as well. Monks in the Noble One's Discipline. Somebody was asking me about this today. Singing is wailing. In the Noble One's Discipline, dancing is madness. In the Noble One's Discipline, to laugh excessively, displaying one's teeth, is childishness. Therefore, monks, in regard to singing and dancing, let there be the demolition of the bridge. When you smile, rejoicing in the Dhamma, you may simply show a smile. So here it says, actually, that you should smile. So here's one place, you know, people say, well, I don't know about this smiling. Nobody ever, I didn't read, you can smile in the suttas. Well, here it says, you may simply show a smile. And he talks about smiling. And also not to dance and to sing and to, if you're a monk. But if you're a lay person, you can go ahead and do all of that. So the last one of these here, I think is pretty good and Kirsten's probably tired of listening to it but it's Angutra Nikaya 160 hard to dispel bhikkhus these five things once arisen are hard to dispel what five lust once arisen is hard to dispel hatred once arisen is hard to dispel delusion once arisen is hard to dispel. Discernment, once arisen, is hard to dispel. I mean, I think that's thinking about things. The last one, the urge to travel, once arisen, is hard to dispel. And what are you thinking about right now? What's the pl- when's the plane going to get there? Am I going to make it? Oh boy, I'm going to go somewhere. This is going to be fun. Oh boy. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you traveled from this place to another. You thought about it. You thought, oh, that'll be good. Why did you come? You didn't come to suffer. You know, maybe you did suffer a little bit, but you didn't. You had this idea in mind, you know. Um, The Arhat has no desire to go anywhere. He's happy where he is. Somebody says, why don't you come over here and teach? He says, okay, I can come. But he doesn't care about where it is. So he just goes and teaches wherever. So he's happy. He's not thinking... He's not thinking, oh, I wonder if, I wonder where I could go. Maybe Thailand's this night, good this time of year. You know, so he, has the, he doesn't have that. The craving is not pulling at him. So the fact that you are in this human existence, you should take advantage of this. And everybody here, of course, is taking advantage. Because it's so hard to get to the human realm that it is not something that you want to throw away light, lightly. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard this sutta, this short sutta about the, the turtle. Mahavaga Samyutta Nikaya 47, number 48 and 8. Yoke with a hole. Bhikkhu, suppose a man would throw a yoke with a single hole into the great ocean. And there was a blind turtle which would come to the surface once every hundred years. What do you think, Bhikkhus, would that blind turtle coming to the surface once every hundred years insert its neck into that yoke with a single hole? If it would ever do so, Venerable Sir, it would only be after a very long time. Sooner, I say, would that blind turtle coming to the surface once every hundred years insert its neck into that yoke with a single hole, then the fool who has gone once to the nether world would regain the human state. For what reason? Because here, bhikkhus, there is no conduct guided by Dhamma, no righteous conduct, no wholesome activity, no meritorious activity. Here there prevails mutual devouring, the devouring of the weak. For what reason, bhikkhus? They have not seen the Four Noble Truths. What for? The Noble Truth of Suffering. The Noble Truth of the Way Leading to the Cessation of Suffering, and so on. Therefore, bhikkhus, an exertion should be made to under, understand. This is suffering. An exertion should be made to understand. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. 
So that turtle comes up one time in all of the oceans of the earth. And one time that yoke is going to be just floating over the turtle and it goes bink. And that's the chance. And that happens only one every hundred years that yoke is, is out there. So it would take longer for you once you go into the lower realms, the animal realms, the ghosts, the, you know, whatever the realms, for you to come back out of there. It's said that the lifespan in those realms can be uh, interminable because you're not making any merit. You, there's no good happening. So be careful in this lifetime with what you do because you don't want to lose this chance. You don't want to go over that cliff and try to make your way back. Eventually, some good merit that you've done, of course, you've done a lot of good merit here, will come back and you'll be reborn. But it's said that a human being reborn from the lower realms is reborn into a poor house. They're reborn maybe with disabilities. Um, they have a hard life and their life is short. And if they don't have the chance to make any merit, then they go right back down again because it's likely they, they're poor, they end up stealing again, they end up trying to survive, and that leads to back down we go. And that's the cycle of ignorance because they don't know. They don't know the Four Noble Truths. They don't know that what they're doing is not creating that 401k in the future for them. What are the benefits of loving kindness? The 11 benefits of loving kindness. Monks, for one whose liberation through loving kindness is cultivated, developed, pursued, handed the reins and taken as a basis, given a grounding, steadied, consolidated, and well undertaken, 11 benefits can be expected. Which 11? One sleeps easily. He wakes easily. He dreams no evil dreams. One is dear to human beings, dear to non-human beings. The devas protect one. Neither fire, poison, nor weapons can touch one. One's mind gains concentration quickly. One's complexion is bright. One dies unconfused, and if penetrating no higher, is headed for the Brahma worlds. So many benefits to developing loving-kindness. Now, to fully um, get the benefits of the uh, of of the loving kindness, you should you should uh, bring it to total success, which means you become an anagami. That means you fully get the benefits. Somebody says, "Well, I did a metta retreat. I just had a nightmare." Well, you need to you know go through the attainments and lose all of the defilements. But that's the benefit of taking metta and going through that process. It's not going to happen all at once, but it will. And you'll sleep, eat more easily, you'll wake easily, you'll have not so many evil dreams. I mean, I've had dreams in the past where I've been shot, just point blank shot. It's like, what? <laughs> and, you know, we all have these crazy things that have happened to us, you know, or being chased or get lost or a lot of suffering happens at night and you wake up and sometimes it's like you're just waking out of another world where you just were and it's like takes a while to okay you know you're not in the greatest mood what are the advantages of friendship he who main and this is from the mitana samsa uh, from agata uh, from the Mugapaka Jataka. This is from a Jataka tale. Let's make sure I have, yeah. Advantages of friendship. He who maintains genuine friendship, who is not treacherous toward friends, will, whenever he goes far out of his home, receive abundance of hospi uh, hospitality. Many will obtain their living through him. Two, he who maintains genuine friendship will, whatever country, village, or town he visits, be honored. He who maintains genuine friendship, robbers will not overpower him. Royalty will not look down upon him. 
He will triumph over all his enemies. 4. He who maintains genuine friendship returns home with a feeling of amity, rejoices in the assemblies of people, and becomes the chief among his kinsmen. 5. He who maintains genuine friendship, being hospitable to others in turn, receives hospitality. Being respectful to others in turn, receives respect. He enjoys both praise and fame. 6. He who maintains genuine friendship, being a giver, in turn receives gifts himself. Being worshipful, worshipful to others, in turn himself is worshipped. He attains prosperity and fame. He who maintains genuine friendship shines in glory like the fire and is radiant as a deity. Never will prosperity forsake him. He who maintains genuine friendship, to him there will be many breeding cattle. What is sown in the field will flourish. The fruit of that which is sown he enjoys. He who maintains genuine friendship, should he fall from a precipice or a mountain or a tree, he will be protected, will not be harmed. He who maintains genuine friendship cannot be overthrown by enemies, even as the deep-rooted banyan tree cannot be overthrown by the wind. So, maintain genuine friendship. And you just may look out your window and have a lot of cattle out in your driveway. <laughs> <clears throat> be probably a good thing in Texas, I don't know. The fathom long body contains all. This is in the Angutra Nikaya 4.45. In this fathom long body with its perceptions and thoughts, there is the world, the origin of the world, the ending of the world, and the path leading to the ending of the world. That's you. You are this fathom long body, and in that is the world. You, you, everything you see, this is your world, whatever you perceive. There's not a world out there. This is the world here, because the world out there is only an idea, and then you, then you run across it, and then it is your world. But in fact, this is your world. And the last part of this small little set of things People say, well, what is feeling? The Buddha was asked, what is feeling? Uh, Vedana is Pali for feeling. And he said, feeling is anything which can be felt. So there's, well, what do I six R? Is that a feeling? Is that a mental feeling? Is that a pleasant feeling? Is that an unpleasant feeling? I felt despair. Is that a feeling? Did you feel it? I felt a pain in my leg. Yeah, you certainly felt that. Uh, I felt kind of happy. Was that a feeling? Yeah, you felt it. So there are these three feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. And if you can feel it, it's a feeling. You can just put that aside in your for, for later considering, because you'll, you'll run across that, that idea. Um, did that one. So, <clears throat> what is craving? This will be a little bit off the beaten track, but some people say, well, craving, craving. What, what, okay, does, what's that? Desire. Well, the Buddha did define craving. He defined craving in all of its 18 types. There's 18 types of craving. Monks, uh, I don't have the, I don't have the reference here. It's from probably Anguja Nikaya. Monks, I will teach you craving, the ensnarer that has flowed along, spread out and caught hold with which this world is smothered and enveloped like a tangled skein, a knotted ball of, of string like matted rushes and reeds, and does not go beyond transmigration, beyond the plains of deprivation, woe, and bad destinations. Listen well, and I will speak. Yes, Lord, the monks responded. The Blessed One said, 
And which craving is the ensnare that has flowed along, spread out, and caught hold, with which this world is smothered and enveloped like a tangled skein, and so on. These 18 craving verbalizations dependent on what is internal, and 18 craving verbalizations dependent on what is external. And which of the 18 craving verbalizations dependent on what is internal? There being I am, there comes to be I am here, there comes to be I am like this, I am otherwise, I am bad, I am good, I might be, I might be here, I might be like this, I might be otherwise, may I be here, may I be like this, may I be otherwise, I will be, I will be here, I will be like this, I will be otherwise. These are the 18 craving verbalizations dependent on what is internal. So all of this thought, taking everything personally in your mind, thinking about yourself in the future, thinking about yourself here, thinking about yourself in the past. This is, this is craving. This is I, the I. And which are the 18 craving verbalizations dependent on what is external? There being I am because of this. By means of this, there comes to be, I am here because of this. There comes to be, I am like this because of this. I am otherwise because of this. I am bad because of this. I am good because of this. I might be because of this. I might be here because of this. I might be like this because of this. I might be otherwise because of this. May I be because of this. May I be here because of this. May I be like this because of this. May I be otherwise because of this. I will be because of this. I will be here because of this. I will be like this because of this. I will be otherwise because of this. These are the 18 craving verbalizations dependent on what is external. So what does that mean? It's, I don't like this. That's, I, I am this because I have a painful feeling. And therefore, I am. And it's like, I am because of this. I am because of the sense spaces. And this is everything that is external that you don't like or you like or you just have a neutral feeling for. So there's, this is the 18 cravings that are dependent on what is external. So these are the 36 craving verbalizations. Thus, with 36 craving verbalizations of this sort in the past, 36 in the future, and 36 in, in the present, there are 108 craving verbalizations. This monks is the craving, the ensnare that has flowed along, spread out and caught hold, with which this world is smothered and enveloped like a tangled skein knotted ball of string like matted rushes and reeds and does not go beyond transmigration, beyond the plains of deprivation, woe, and bad destinations. 108 kinds of craving. So what is it? It's, it's just thinking. It's not liking. But the Buddha did specify very exactly all the little thought, thought forms that you have all the ways that you don't like and you like and that you just are here when you a neutral feeling is something like if you feel like well not much is going on you're still taking that personally like i don't feel like there's anything going on if you're six Ring, you would think oh nothing much is happening i'm aware of this feeling there is a feeling of not much happening so there's, there's being aware of a neutral feeling as well as the uh, unpleasant and the pleasant. I, you know, I'm not going to get into you know, all of the details of this, but if you ever want to know what craving is, it is laid out. And I think the last one is something that... Um, it's something to think about for in the future, that if you... If you run into suffering and you run into a bad situation, you can always think of Puna.
Venerable Puna, this is from the Samyutta Nikaya. Venerable Puna goes to the Buddha and asks for a teaching before he departs to the foreign land of Sunaparanta. The Buddha warns him that folk there are fierce and questions whether he is ready for such a difficult assignment. This is a teaching in looking at the positive side of experience. Now that you have received this brief exhortation from me, Puna, in which country will you dwell? There is, Venerable Sir, a country named Sunaparanta. I will dwell there. The, see, this is the Buddha telling his arhats to go and take the teachings to various places in India. So he says, where would you like to go? Puna, the people of Sunaparanta are wild and rough. If they abuse and revile you, what will you think about that? Venerable Sir, if the people of Sunaparanta abuse and revile me, then I will think, these people of Sunaparatana are excellent, truly excellent, in that they do not give me a blow with the fist. Then I will think thus, blessed one, then I will think thus, fortunate one. But Puna, if the people of Sunaparatana do give you a blow with the fist, what will you think about that? Venerable Sir, if the people of Sunaparatana do give me a blow with the fist, then I will think these people of Sunaparanta are excellent, truly excellent, in that they do not give me a blow with a clod. Then I will think thus, blessed one, then I will think thus. But Puna, if the people of Sunaparanta do give you a blow with a clod, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if the people of Sunaparatana give me a blow with a clod, then I will think, these people of Sunaparatana are excellent truly excellent, in that they do not give me a blow with a rod. Then I will think thus, blessed one, then I will think thus, fortunate one. But Puna, if the people of Sunaparantana do give you a blow with a rod, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if the people of Sunaparantana give me a blow with a rod, then I will think these people of Sunaparantana are excellent, truly excellent, in that they do not stab me with a knife. Then I will think thus, blessed one, then I will think thus, fortunate one. But Puna, if people of Sunaparantana do stab you with a knife, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if the people of Sunaparantana stab me with a knife, then I will think these people of Sunaparantana are excellent, truly excellent, in that they do not take my life with a sharp knife. Then I will think thus, blessed one, then I will think thus, fortunate one. But Puna, if the people of Sunaparantana do take your life with a sharp knife, what will you think about that? Venerable sir, if the people of Sunaparantana take my life with a sharp knife, then I will think, there have been disciples of the Blessed One who, being repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by the body and by life, sought, sought for an assailant. But I have come upon this assailant without a search then I will think thus, blessed one. Then I will think thus, fortunate one. So he's saying that there are monks who who want nothing to do more with samsara. They want to attain nibbana and get off the wheel, and that's and they will they will seek their assailant. Their assailant will help them to attain parinibbana. So he's saying, oh, he doesn't even have to look for the assailant to help him to go to Parinibbana. Good, good, Puna, endowed with such self-control and peacefulness, you will be able to dwell in the Sunaparatna country. Now, Puna, you may go at your own convenience. Then, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's statement, the Venerable Puna rose from his seat, paid homage to the Blessed One, and departed, keeping him on his right side. He then set his lodging in order, took his bowl and outer robe, and set out to wander towards the Sunaparantana country. Wandering by stages, he eventually arrived in Sunaparantana country where he, he dwelt. So I will tell you to go to your places of residence, dwell there, and if you are assailed by verbal abuse, then think that you're not at least assailed by a clod 
If you're assailed by a CLAWD or TSA security, at least they didn't come after you with a knife. <laughs>